Bueno, eh, vamos a empezar ahora la presentación de Alfonso Celso Pastore, acá en el marco de esta importante cumbre del IAEF. Yo me presento, soy Guillermo Laborda y voy a hacer unas, una mini introducción de, de Celso. En este tradicional encuentro del IAEF y junto a todas las eh, experiencias y grandes relatos que hemos tenido y herramientas de análisis, eh, en esta ocasión, en este bloque, el Banco Ciudadanos propone una vez más sumar una mirada regional con un keynote speaker, como en años anteriores, cuando estuvo aquí, por ejemplo, Felipe Larraín, que es el actual Ministro de Hacienda de, de Chile, Andrés Velasco, de la London School of Economics, o Paulo Leme, que también estuvo aquí, quien fuera CEO de, de Goldman Sachs. En esta oportunidad haremos especial foco sobre Brasil, nuestro principal socio comercial, para ello contamos aquí con la presencia de uno de los más prestigiosos economistas latinoamericanos, el doctor Afonso Celso Pastore, quien fuera presidente del Banco Central de Brasil, además de haber sido secretario del Departamento del Tesoro de San Pablo. En la actualidad se desempeña como un reconocido asesor económico en Brasil para Latin Source, es profesor de posgrado en la Fundación Getulio Vargas y preside su consultora, hace Pastore y Asociados en San Pablo. El análisis de las perspectivas económicas mundiales tiene a la desaceleración de las principales economías, a las tensiones comerciales y a las condiciones financieras más restrictivas como factores que nos impactan más allá de las problemáticas propias de cada uno de los países de la región. Y lo que ocurra en Brasil en este escenario tiene una gran influencia sobre la Argentina. Por lo cual es muy importante escuchar todo lo que nuestro invitado tiene para transmitirnos hoy. Nada más, le damos la palabra al doctor Pastore, a quien agradecemos muchísimo por acompañarnos en el día de hoy, la verdad que es un lujo, y por supuesto también muchas gracias al Banco Ciudad por hacer posible que esté aquí con nosotros. Muchas gracias uh, a ustedes todos. Usted no ha hablado de una cosa muy importante, yo no voy a hacer la, mi presentación en español, yo voy a hacer en inglés. Y ya voy a explicarlos en un momento. Mas, primero de comenzar, yo quería agradecer a uh, Jorge Saumeli, que es el presidente de la, de la IEF, y a, 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 a Javier a Batalla, que es el uh, presidente del Banco Ciudad, por esa gentil invitación. Para mí es un placer. I am shifting to English, and let me tell you the story. Pueden hacer, eh, canalizar después las preguntas, si quieren, en cualquier momento a través de, del sistema tradicional que vamos a habilitar después. I had a certain proud until 20 years ago. I used to come very often to Argentina, to Uruguay, and I have many friends, many academic friends in the academia, which are Argentinians, Chileans, uh, like Andrés Velasco, like uh, Felipe Larraín, uh, like Javier Batalla, and some others, uh, until something like 15 years ago, my daughter moved into Italy. Uh, she's a lawyer, and she decided to be specializing in some funny area in law and economics. And she went to, uh, for a master's degree at the University of Bologna. One week, one week after she arrived there, she met a kind of a Marcello Mastroianni uh, an Italian to which he fell in love, deeply in love. He fell deeply in love for her. They got married. They now live in Italy. So uh, we and my wife have to take a decision and say, what we do? Because we, we don't want to lose this uh, daughter, neither the, the, the nipoti, I mean, the, the, the offspring. So we started going to Italy very frequently. Let's say uh, from Christmas, uh, before Christmas and before New Year's Eve, let's say for three weeks or four weeks, we spend in Bologna. And we acquired friends there, and I and I had to start talking uh, Italian that I used it to talk when, when I was a kid. Then the more my Italian improved, the more my Spanish uh, deteriorated. <laughs> And I discovered that there are three languages in the world which are incompatible, the three of them, at the same time. The Italian, the Spanish, and the Portuguese. You may choose two. If you put a third, then it, it doesn't work. 
so my Spanish uh, started to deteriorate. I lost uh, the, the, the vocabulary, so I feel uncomfortable in talking in, 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 in Spanish, so I apologize. I will go in English very slowly now for us to, to, to see uh, how things go. And in compensation, let me talk standing for you because I feel now more comfortable. Now, let me start by the international economy. Look into this situation, which is called the new normal. I think I better see it, because I, I, I'm afraid I fall. It's the new normal. It's a situation in which I have two graphs there that more or less depict what I'm telling about. The graph in the upper part has interest rates for four countries. These are treasury rates, sovereign bonds rates of 10 years maturity. Germany, UK, US, and Japan. Since the 1990s, all of them are declining. They have been declining steadily over time. Uh, during the crisis, 2008, 2009, we saw a very interesting situation. All central banks in the world brought interest rates, the basic rate of interest, close to zero. They did what they had to do in order to avoid the mistake that was done by the Federal Reserve in 1929, when the Federal Reserve had to ease monetary policy, and rather than easing, they decided to tighten it. And that produced the big depression, or the, the, the Great Depression. Of course, at that time, we were on the gold standard. So the gold standard, as you know, is a system of fixed exchange rates. So the contraction of the money supply in the U.S. produced by the automatic mechanism of the gold standard, a contraction of money supply in Europe, and then a crisis that started in the U.S. Was spread out through Europe or to Latin America or to some other countries. Well, Ben Bernanke was the governor of the, the Federal Reserve. And he had uh, researched extensively about the, 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 the Great uh, Depression of the 29s. He has a marvelous book on that uh, issue, on, on, that, on that subject. <coughs> and he knew that he had to ease monetary policy. And the other central bankers in the world already uh, knew that as well. In, 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 in Britain, in, in the Europe, the ECB, they knew it. Uh, uh, they knew that in Canada, and they knew that in Japan. So they eased monetary policy, and uh, we said, well, we are not going to face again a great depression because the central banks are doing what they have to do. But we had a second guess about it. Let's say, what will happen to interest rates when countries start to recover? Because certainly they will recover because they are doing the right uh, reaction monetary policy. Well, we reached 2010, 2011, Many of those countries started to recover and did recover. The U.S., uh, the unemployment rate in the U.S. at the peak of the 2008-2009 Great Recession reached 10% of labor force. It declined steadily. It's now below 4. The economy is growing. They are now decelerating after the big recovery. Europe recovered. Now it's decelerating after the big recovery. But we never saw interest rates going up again. They didn't go up. They continued to decline. More recently, we are facing a, a, a look to a second thing. The rate of interest in Japan declined earlier than in Europe, or in Germany, or in the US, or in the UK. Now, the uh, government bonds in Japan and in Europe are paying negative interest rates. Interest rates in the U.S. are now, at uh, the 10 years, is uh, two and a half. Uh, now it's below 2%. It's declining. It's a decline in the U.K. Well, why have those rates declined so steadily over time and never recovered? In the graph below, I have a different uh, definition of interest rates, what the economists call the neutral rate of interest, a rate of interest that produces the equilibrium between savings and investments in a country that ha happens to be, as well, the equilibrium between aggregate demand and aggregate supply. 
when the real rate of interest is equal to the real neutral rate of interest, the economy is in equilibrium. It has an inflation which is the equilibrium rate, I mean a target rate of inflation. Potential GDP grows at the same rate of actual GDP. Unemployment is equal to the unsustainable rate of unemployment, the NIRU uh, concept in the US. Now, the neutral rate of interest has been declining. Uh, uh, these estimates which are there are not mine. There is one uh, of the members of the board of the Federal Reserve, Mr. John Williams, that is a very well-reputed economist. He has been an economist since three centuries ago when I started studying economics. He has been at the, the, federal, the San Francisco Federal Reserve, which is a very strong Federal Reserve as far as research is concerned and some of the things as well. And uh, he plus uh, 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 co-author of his, uh, Mr. Laubach, they uh, discovered a way uh, to estimate econometrically a model that shows how neutral rates of interest behave in the world. These are their estimates for the neutral rates in the US, in the, East, in the Euro area, in, in, in the UK, and in Canada which is not there, one is not there, it's Japan. Uh, but Japan we know, that Japan is very similar to Europe. Uh, Europe now has a neutral rate of interest, equilibrium rate of interest, around zero, in real terms. The US that used it to have, in the 90s, a real interest rate of equilibrium between two and a half and three and a half percent per year, I'm talking about real. The real equilibrium now is a half percent per year a big decline. You look at the upper graph, you are going to see that interest rates started to decline first in Japan, before they started declining in Germany, before they started declining that much in the UK or in the US. What is there? What are the forces which are bringing this uh, real interest rate down or this neutral interest rate down? Now, there is an economist that was under Secretary of Treasury in the US, very influential. Uh, his name is Larry Summers. Larry Summers has been writing extensively about this kind of phenomenon. And he has been, he uh, uh, created a kind of a definition in which he talk about a global stagnation process, which is a process in which rates of growth of countries, of uh, mature countries, uh, slows down and stays on a low level, and interest rates, real and nominal, in those mature countries, they go down and they stay down in those levels. I say, obviously this thing is happening, because you look to data, you see that it's happening. You look to the estimates of the neutral rates, you see that that is happening. Question is, why is that happening? So is this a kind of a cyclical phenomenon? Is this something that is going to be uh, 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 for a while with us and then those rates go up as we thought they should go after the, uh, the absorption of the crisis of 2008 and 2009? Or this is a more permanent phenomenon, something that tells us that this thing really came down? Well, they started writing and uh, doing research. And there is a very interesting piece of research published in the previous number of the Brookings uh, uh, paper of economic activity in which there is uh, one uh, particular, uh, this is not the only one, I'm just quoting because of the author is more famous, uh, between Larry Summers and uh, a young economist from the Bank of England. Uh, they both together look at that and they say, what are the forces behind? Uh, the Lucas Rachel is the name of this uh, English economist. What are the forces behind that? Now, I, I stated the neutral rate of interest as being a kind of an equilibrium real rate. And there are several equilibriums that happens here. One of them is between savings and investment. Let's think a little about us. Why do we save? We save because we want to spare some money when we get old, in order to consume when we get old. Well, assume that we're caught by the information that real interest rates have increased and it's going to stay permanently higher. What do we do? 
we have the option of consuming today or consuming later. So if interest rate is higher, if I save now, I will accumulate more wealth to increase my consumption later. So really the rise in interest rate produces a rise in savings. So the savings schedule is an upward uh, bending supply curve. You put real interest rate in one axis, savings on the other one, it rises with the rise in interest rate. The reverse happens with investments. Let's say if the opportunity cost of capital, it's instead of putting your money on your enterprise to produce, you buy a fixed income asset, the higher this interest rate, the less you want to put in your factory. The lower it is, the more you want to put in your factory. So the rate of, the, the demand for investment is a declining function of the real rate of interest. There is one particular rate of interest that equilibrates both. This is the neutral rate of interest. And this, by the way, is the way that uh, 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 Laubach and Williams uses in his cumbersome econometric model to estimate the paths of those rates in those countries. Suppose that a country goes into what we call transitional demo demographic transition. Let's say, when I was young, with black hair, I was sitting at the University of Sao Paulo and I had a lectures on demography. And I learned, uh, let's say, you have a certain rate of growth of population. At that time, Brazilian rate of growth of population was around 3% per year. And the mortality rate was much higher than it is today. So the, the, the perspective of surviving after the 60 years old was meager at that point. Now, let's say, uh, the, the expected life in Brazil is 75, expected life. So if you are at 50, you may expect to live at 85 or 90. So the size of the old population increases when you have this demographic transition. And the proportion of the active working population, the young guys, it reduces. If you have a young guy having to decide how much to save and how much to consume, and he knows that he has the risk of living much more, he has to increase his savings. So when you face a demographic transition like that, you have a shift to the right of this supply curve of uh, savings. That encounters the declining demand for investments in a lower rate of interest. So the demographic transition produces a decline in interest rate. Why have I mentioned uh, Japan? Because we know that Japan is much older than, than, than Europe. And Japan started a demographic transition much before Europe started. So rates of interest decline in Japan before they decline in Europe. The demographic transition is going on in the, in, in the US, but it's, um, it's coming later than it started in Europe. So interest rates declined at first in Europe, then they are declining in the, in the US. There is a demographic transition here also in, in Argentina, and there is a very important demographic transition going on in Brazil, such that Brazil was compelled to do a social security reform. Why? Because the number of people receiving benefits from the social security is increasing over time. We are on a pay-as-you-go system in which the young guys are paying to the social security, the old guys are receiving. The quantity of people contributing to the fund of social security is shrinking in relation to the number of people which are benefiting from that. So we need a big social security reform. Uh, we know that effect about the social security. What we were not aware of it, that has also an effect on the neutral rate of interest. <laughs> the neutral rate of interest is declining as well in Brazil. It's declining all around the world. So what I'm saying here, I'm saying that demographic transition may be everything less than a cyclical thing. You don't have a cyclical demographic transition. People get older, less people young, uh, you have permanent factors that shift this thing. Let's say women work more. If they have to work more, they have less time to dedicate to children, so they rationally they decide to have less children. Uh, the health improves. The health improves. Everybody gets the health service, so everybody uh, 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 lives more. 
So when you have a demographic transition, you have an older society. And if you have an older society, you have a society in which the young guys have to, to save more. So the decline in the real rate of interest is something like a permanent phenomenon. It's not a transitory phenomenon. I'm insisting on that because we are f it's a funny thing to have negative rates of interest in Europe. Well, this is becoming common. It's funny to see a country that used to have the highest real interest rate in the world, like Brazil, having a declining rate of interest. It's not funny. It's a process. It's going on. And uh, since it's going on, we are going to have to live with a different world from the world we have been accustomed to live with. A world with lower rates of interest, and unfortunately with low growth rates. And uh, paying much more attention to uh, you know, to, to, to the meio ambiente, how you say that, to environment, uh, to, to quality of life, to quality of consumption, rather than imitating the, uh, someone else's consumption, because you need to save more. So that has influence on capital flows to emerging markets. That has several influences on the economies of the countries. But the one of the things which we, we face here is that we have to face uh, something different. Now, still referring to the world as a whole. I have two graphs here. The upper one shows, uh, 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 that's a PMI index for the US economy. It's uh, incredible. The PMI is an index of the managers of purchases of the enterprise, of the industries. Those guys, they know how much the industry is going to buy of inputs. So they have, to be, uh, they have to be in their hands the best information about the production, the plans of production of the enterprise. That kind of index tracks almost exactly the 12-month rate of growth of industrial output. Uh, when it reaches the 50 line, it goes to the negative. You see the yellow or the, the blue one, one of them is the industry, the other one is the PMI. So they go together. U.S. economy is clearly decelerating, much more in industry than in services, but decelerating. The down graph is the same for Europe. These are the PMIs for five countries there in the euro area. All of them are crossing the 50 line. So Europe is going to the decline of industrial production faster than the U.S. The U.S. is still on the positive side, but both are decelerating. Europe is reaching the verge of a recession such that uh, Mario Draghi, one of his last acts as the governor of the European Central Bank, have decided to reduce even further the basic rate of interest, uh, which was almost in the zero bound, and uh, do another round of quantitative easing, so buying long-term uh, capital uh, investments or bonds in order to stimulate aggregate demand. Let's say it, uh, the, the, the European uh, monetary policy, now being on the zero bound, has very near little space to influence the capacity of Europe to react. So the only capacity of Europe, uh, Europe to pick up would be to have a big jump in is fiscal spending. But countries in Europe are not able to do this fiscal spending, with the exception of Germany, which is in a beautiful fiscal situation, the other countries in Europe are facing difficulties. Not that it doesn't pay to do a fiscal adjustment. Look at Greece. Greece did it at the cost of the Greek people. They are now much better than they were before. But you know, uh, uh, democratic societies, they have governments which have short lives, uh, short life. So uh, it's difficult to approve a very austere program on the fiscal. And then there are countries that will never do it because uh, they, if they did it, they could use the fiscal expansionary. Uh, now they cannot. I don't see Europe recovering so soon. I see the US is still with a lot of capacity to do counter-cyclical policy, either on the monetary or on the fiscal policy. So US will not go to a recession. It will just decelerate. But Europe and the US decelerating, certainly you have an effect on the world economy. You have China also decelerating. China is now uh, going to the a growth of 6% per year, and as time goes by, 
they are shifting downwards. So this is a natural phenomenon in China. It's not a recession, it's not a crisis, it's a natural tendency of growth. If you look at emerging markets, all of them are growing or uh, are in a recession. Let's say we both, I mean Argentina and Brazil, are facing our own problems. You are still in a recession, let's say in the process of adjustment. We are on a path of very slow recovery. Let's say this year, 0.8, I understood today that the Brazilian Central Bank has uh, marked up the projection of GDP growth and normals increase from 0.8 to 0.9 this year. So next year, we are still talking about 1.7% growth. So it's a small growth, and the two economies are influencing each other in the negative way, uh, which I'll come later in the point. Why am I talking about that? Because you have uh, a lot of problems in the short run. Let's say Brazil has a low economic growth, low inflation, and low rates of interest for a long period of time. It's similar to what is happening in the world for different reasons. Let's say the weight of that uh, 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 so-called uh, demographic transition is smaller. But we are with unemployment. We have idle capacity. And we do not have the capacity of using international trade to increase it. Because the world is decelerating. China decelerating brings commodity prices down. And Argentina going into a recession, like you are, for some time is hitting Brazilian industry, particularly the automotive industry. So forget about an impulse coming from the aggregate demand from the external side. Now, look at the other components of growth. One of them would be the fiscal. Could the government spend more to, through the multiplier effect to produce a rise in aggregate demand? No, on the contrary. The government is cutting spending. They are on a fiscal consolidation because they want to put the debt to GDP growth to a zero growth and then start declining. So we still are cutting spending. So the contrary is happening with the fiscal. What about uh, the other components? Uh, there is a, I will come to that in a moment about families consumption. I think this is increasing. Since we are facing a process of monetary ease, uh, I am uh, certain that interest rates are technically capable of declining much further than they declined already without any risks of inflation. So consumption will keep on a, this uh, rise, uh, but this is not a big enough rise to produce a big jump in economic growth. And uh, we don't have, with the exception of construction, we don't have industries able to invest. Let's say, I will put in a moment to you two graphs. The upper end is to the rates of growth of uh, uh, GDP in Brazil. You see 2008, 2009, the crisis took two quarters. It was very deep. But the economy rebounded immediately. In the third quarter, we were already growing at a very high rate, more than 10% annualizing. So that recession was a very short recession. The graph down plots all crises, all cycles we, have, we had in Brazil since the 1980s. 100 is the quarter before the recession started. And then you go, if it goes to 90, you had a 10% decline up to that point, and then it shows the recovery. The black line is the present cycle. It started declining, uh, let's say, many, many quarters after that, let's say we were 6% below the peak, we are now 5.5%, uh, we're now 5% points of percentage below the previous peak. Industry in Brazil, is 15% below the previous peak, 15%. The other day I, f I made a graph superposing world industrial production with Brazilian industrial production since 1990. They go together, together, it's incredible. The rates are the same until 2007 when both declined during the world crisis by the same amount, both recovered almost by the same amount in the, the same time. They go together until 2013, 
Then Brazilian industrial output turns down, falls 15 points of percentage from that level, and the world keeps on growing. Presently, the world industrial output is 40 points of percentage above Brazil industrial uh, uh, output. Industry in Brazil is suffering more than the services sector, than the retailing sector. Part of that, I'm not uh, uh, putting the guilt on Argentina, but uh, the, the reduction of imports from Argentina plays it's not the majority of that, because that started because Argentina, we were already on that position before Argentina declined. So uh, the 15 points is not that. I would say if there was some hope of a certain recovery, then Argentina could help. But Argentina then went to a recession and we couldn't count on that. That's just a, a small footnote on this. Well, that says, that industry has to have in Brazil a big idle capacity. With a big idle capacity, you cannot expect those industrialists to increase capacity output, to increase the gross fixed capital formation by buying capital goods. Well, fortunately, our, uh, 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 this is again uh, showing uh, the upper end is industry with double counting. Uh, 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 it's not the GDP, it's total production. Uh, uh, adding up uh, uh, the intermediate goods and the, 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 the final goods. And the lower uh, graph is production of manufactured products affected by Argentina, that, uh, in that case. I say I'm putting here a small effect. I say this is an effect that is, is not, that decline you see in the industrial output occurred much before the, the, the 2018 effect on Argentina, so I'm, I'm not claiming that. Uh, that is the upper end, is what is happening to gross fixed capital formation in proportion to GDP. Let's say when Brazil was recovering from the recession, we were with that at 20, 21 percent of GDP, we are now down to 16, 15 percent of GDP. The lower uh, graph shows the index of uncertainty uh, built by Vargas Foundation. Uncertainty is very high. So what I'm telling here is that we cannot expect from industrial investments a push in, in gross fixed capital formation, which is a big component of aggregate demand. Just to make a different note here, I think that in construction we have some uh, uh, hope of increase. That leads us to the projection of next year having a growth of Brazilian GDP that can be 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, 1.9. That's the order of magnitude, what, what I think we, what we can. Why am I more optimistic about in the industry? Because we removed certain uh, risks. The risk was uh, when a buyer of an apartment breached the contract, the courts obliged the constructor to give the money back plus interest, as if they had a deposit in a bank. Okay, good for the buyer, horrible for the constructor. That thing was eliminated, this risk. Now you have a, a law that regulates the breach of a contract. You have to negotiate and you have procedures to do the fair negotiation between the two, so the risk to the construction came down. And we are facing, as I mentioned to you, and I'll be more emphatic on that, a period of very low interest rates that really tells to the constructors that they can get a lot of finance to construct and then pass on those finance to the buyer of the apartment. So I think construction is going to come up next year. So part of our optimism about a certain rebound of the economy is construction. Some type of investment, I think, can go on. The other part which is there reflected is consumption. The upper graph is superimposing two quarterly rates of growth. One of them, the blue one, is families' consumption estimated in the national accounts. And the yellow one is, uh, 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 came out of a monthly series of retail sales. Uh, constructed by the same official agency in Brazil. You see that they go together. So 
retail sales really is a good estimate of families consumption. You see families consumption all since 2017 on the positive range. Well, retail sales, uh, you can test that with a good econometrics and you do not uh, deny the hypothesis. It's very sensitive to the market real rate of interest. Market real rate of interest has been declining and is going still to decline. So uh, you have some force. But then you look to the labor market. Well, unemployment rate is still at 20%. But if you remove from the unemployment people which are working part-time or people which are uh, 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 in, in informal uh, uh, sectors in the economy, unemployment is still over 25. So population, employed population has been increasing, but has been increasing in the informal sector. That has no guarantees of the employment. So the real wages is not, are not rising. So if they are not rising, they put up, they, they reduce part of the effect that the declining interest rate could produce on consumption. So we keep on assuming that consumption is going to stay positive, it's going to keep, keep growing, but you know, it has to face the situation that the labor market is still very poor. It will be improving, I think it will improve, and it will improve more when the construction sector picks up, because a lot of hiding in the construction sector is on formal labor, so that tends to help, but you cannot expect much from consumption. Now, where do we go from now? We have just this inflation thing. Let's say I showed you one graph here about the size of the cycle. GDP is 5% below the previous peak. If I make the same graph for the per capita income, we are going to see a different picture. Let's say per capita income now is nine points of percentage below the previous peak. Nine points of percentage, we industry as depressed as it is. Output gap is very negative. When output gap is very negative, you have no strength on inflation. So inflation is running below the target in Brazil that presently is at 4%. We are going to finish this year below target. And that leak, uh, uh, takes uh, uh, the central bank to the decision of keep on reducing interest rates. They did reduce the basic rate of interest by 50 points of percentage in the Lex uh, Monetary Policy Committee. We issued a report showing that we expect the next two uh, monetary policy committees to see 50 basis points cut in each one of those. So by the year end, our estimate is that the basic rate of interest nominal is going to be around 4.5%. Uh, 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 it was 6 uh, uh, before this meeting. You look to that, you look at the yield curve. The yield curve has shifted down a lot. Markets are expecting that those rates came down and they are going to stay low for quite a while. You look at real rates of interest, like the, uh, we have indexed bonds, uh, which are protected by inflation, the NTNBs, call it in Brazil. Uh, for 2030, 2040, they are now quoted at three, three and a half percent per year. So it's a very low level of interest rates. So those low interest rates will tend to have put this economy growing a little faster than it's growing now, uh, uh, despite all the difficulties we have. So uh, we look to the Brazilian economy for 2020, I would say, well, wait and see. You are gonna see later uh, rates of interest around 4.5% for the entire year. I mean the basic rate. You're gonna see the economy growing by more than it's growing this year, despite being a low growth. Uh, this low growth is not enough to close the output gap, then inflation is gonna be converging to the target, but there is no risk of inflation going over the target. Now, what is precluding this economy to go on? Let me address a big important question that I think you have a lot of interest in it, which is the fiscal. And in order to address the fiscal, 
let me put just one graph, the upper end, the upper one, that shows the volatility of the real against the volatility of other emerging markets. That yellow line is the volatility. This is the same volatility device you use on your uh, uh, dealing rooms, uh, the Yang Sang uh, system of calculating volatility. The black one is the Brazil's volatility of the real. The yellow one is the, you pick up 20 emerging markets, that's the average for the 20 emerging markets. That gray area uh, excludes the 20% which are, the 10% which are the least volatile, that would be below that level, and the upper end are the 10% the which are the highest volatile. Brazil is oscillating the volatility on the upper end of the volatilities of the more volatile emerging markets. That big peak there is 2018, at the moment in which Argentina had the problem and went to the IMF. Then the, 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 the peso really exploded, and uh, that is out of the discussion. Now, a volatility like that reflects something. I'm a foreign investor. I look to two emerging markets. The two emerging markets have the same interest rate. The two emerging markets have the same CDS quotation, so the same sovereign risk. The two emerging markets increasing 100 points of percentage on their interest rates. Where I, am I, a non-resident in those two countries, put my money? Answer, the one with the least volatility. So I'm not surprised by the fact that after the approval of the, the first round of the social security reform in Brazil, the real has not appreciated. Uh, people used to say, well, once you approve it, everything is okay, so if everything is okay, the real should appreciate. Well, we did approve, I'll come to that in a moment. The reform that was approved was better than the market was expecting. But even so, the volatility of the real stayed high. Why that? Because the social security reform is a necessary condition to put the fiscal Brazil in situation, but is not the sufficient. Even if it had done the full reform, because let's say every time you send something to the Congress, you may be sure that it comes out not equal to the one you send, you have to negotiate. You, that is a give and take process. You reduce the efficiency of that. We reduce the efficiency by less than the market was expecting. So the proposal that went, use it to produce the estimated saving in 10 years in present value was one trillion of reais. The one that was approved is an 850 trillion of reais. The market was expecting one of 600 billion reais, so less than the one we approved. it. So I'm saying it was a good social security reform. The perceived risk stayed there. Why that? Well, let me first look at the first thing, which is the debt to GDP. It was 50% of GDP. I, I have two concepts there, the concept that includes and excludes uh, the uh, uh, bonds in the hands of the central bank. Uh, that's the IMF definition or the Brazilian definition. But anyway, uh, it's in the Brazilian definition is more than 75% of GDP. When Brazil started producing primary deficits, this is from Lula to government onwards, the entire period of Dilma, and then Temer could not change the picture, we went from 50 to 75% of GDP. In order to stabilize the debt to GDP, we need a primary surplus. Of how much? Well, you pick up the rate of interest, real rate, minus the rate of growth of the economy, multiply by the size of the debt, this gives you the size of the primary surplus. Debt to GDP is a ratio. You have debt that grows at the real rate of interest, the denominator is GDP, grows at the growth of the economy, so suppose you have a 4% real rate of interest and a 2% growth. Now 2% of 75 
percent of GDP, you need uh, one and a half percent primary surplus to stabilize the debt to GDP. We are now producing a two percent deficit. So we need a fiscal effort of three points of three and a half points of percentage of GDP. Did the social security reform produce a debt? There was an attempt done by President uh, 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 Temer to give a very strong signal that we had to take seriously this adjustment. Since the Constitution of 1998, we have a lot of spending through, to which the executive branch has no power at all to adjust. One of them is Social Security. The other one that you have some power is payroll. But you have transfers of money to the states, you have those social uh, programs, you have social uh, uh, Bolsa Familia. Uh, a breakdown of spending is there. What they decided to do is to put a constitutional amendment, and they approved it, freezing the total spending of obligatory expenditures in real terms. This is a signal that th we are committed to do that. But in order to do that, they need to approve the reforms that allow the government to do that. One of those reforms is the Social Security reform. Under the condition it was approved, it allows the government to freeze the Social Security spending in proportion to GDP, but not in real terms. So if GDP grows in 2%, it's going to be growing 2% in real terms. The total is frozen. So the Social Security is gradually rising, is squeezing the other parts. So you need other reforms to enter into those other parts. One of them, which is the most important one, is a reform of the human resources of the federal government, in which you need to change completely the way you evaluate the wages, you, uh, for example, uh, 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 employees in the federal government, they have stability in the job, they cannot be fired. You cannot reduce the time they do to work in order to reduce proportionally the wages. You need to redo all this. This has to go to, do, to, go to the Congress. Well, we did, so that has to be done yet. I'm just giving you one example of that. The market looked to that and they say, well, well this is an incomplete uh, reform. It was a very important step forward, I'm not denying that. Now, what about the states? This is my final uh, comment. The states were submitted when Cardoso made the real plan. He knew that we had a huge fiscal problem and uh, we are a federation, the states have a lot of independence. So he decided to approve, and this was an Argentinian idea, fiscal responsibility law. I think Domingo Cavallo made a fiscal responsibility law here. So we copied the Cavallo model. We approved a uh, fiscal responsibility law. That was supposed to put a limit on the uh, uh, personnel spending in the states. The fiscal responsibility law says, let's say, your spending in personnel cannot exceed 60% of the net revenue, the, 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 the net revenue from the government, which is that horizontal black line. Those red lines are the present level of uh, uh, personnel spending in some states. The peak one is the state of Minas Gerais, which is, which is a very big state. It's almost 80% uh, uh, in excess, it's 20% in excess. Well, does the social security reform help the states or not? I started mentioning, let's say, when you send an amendment to the Congress, uh, a proposal to the Congress, the Congress, you have to negotiate, otherwise you don't get the majority. There are two categories. One is the military wages, and the second one are the teachers, professors. It happens that the states, the burden of personnel in the states is on policia militar, military police, plus education. 
plus the salaries of the professors. Everyone else's minimum wage of retirement was increased to 65 years. Militaries and professors was not increased. It stayed there. So it didn't affect the states. If it didn't affect the states, the states will have to do other sorts of cuts in order to comply with the law, which means that they have a very huge fiscal effort to do, part of which, realistically looking to that, I would say will follow on the laps of the federal government because the federal government will have to give them some help. With those two things, and I, I could go much further in this, I would say to you, let's say, Brazil is progressing on the fiscal, is improving on the fiscal, but we have not yet dominated the fiscal. And the proof of that is the fact that the volatility of our exchange rate is, is still high. I think we'll go, I think we'll progress, I think things are gonna, in a certain moment, will be done. There is a lot of pressure from the society. I'm not talking about the quality of the present president, I'm talking about the quality of the society in Brazil, which is pushing. The quality of this society was read by the Congress, by the lower house. The lower house decided to approve it, even if the government had not made any effort to approve the social security. Like the society is putting a lot of effort for the approval of the, the, the tax reform that eliminates the tax or cascading tax and creates a true value added tax that I trust will be approved in the Congress despite the government is not sponsoring that. So there are movements in which you say, well, something else is happening in that country that uh, allows us to, to see something better in the future. But it's going to be a long way, and this way towards uh, more happiness uh, uh, is going to take a lot of our time in our lifetimes. Thank you very much. Bueno, paso, paso a leer las preguntas que nos hicieron llegar, Celso. Le agradezco mucho la, su tiempo y su exposición, realmente muy, muy útil. Bueno, la primera pregunta está relacionada con el Mercosur. ¿Qué futuro le ve al Mercosur a la luz de, de las conducciones políticas que puede llegar a haber a futuro en ambos países los principales socios? Bueno, well, let me start first talking about this agreement, Mercosur and European Union. I think this is a very important step forward, very, very important step forward for both you guys and we. We are going both to benefit from that. Uh, this has been negotiated for the last 20 years. It started with Cardoso down there. There's a lot of difficulties in going through that because th there are interests of pressure groups in Europe or in Argentina or in Brazil. The pressure groups against that here in our part of the world is industry that doesn't like this kind of uh, integration. The biggest uh, supporters of that is agriculture or agribusiness, which do like it. I would say in any reform economy to trade, one must consider the possibility of having winners and losers. That is always like that. When you do a reform, you do have winners and losers. The Industrial Revolution in England had a lot of winners, but have a lot of losers. Let's say all those families that used to do textiles in those uh, uh, artifact uh, machines, they lost their jobs. Uh, it would be impossible to have a David Copperfield uh, romance uh, without having the losers in the, in the Industrial Revolution. So, uh, uh, but, you know, countries do not grow if the industry is not exposed to competition, to, uh, uh, is not pushed towards investing. So I, th I think that we both are going to benefit from that. So uh, uh, I, I, I would like to see this thing signed, approved by the two parliaments. Unfortunately, we are facing some uh, missteps here. Uh, our president, with that speech about the Amazon, uh, created a, a protests in Europe, 
and if I were an European, I would be protesting as well with them. I do not sponsor what he has been saying. But you know, the Green Party in Europe is very, very strong. It's stronger in Germany than it is in, in France. But certainly the position of the Green Party in France provoked the comment of Macron on, on, on that, that almost started a direct fight between France and Brazil. Fortunately, the other countries came in to the picture, like, uh, 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 like uh, Germany or like uh, Britain, and said, well, calm down, let's discuss this thing more freely, more coldly. And I think now the thing is going back to the beginning. I think Mercosur is a good idea, is an important idea, uh, uh, not as a, a, a union, as a Mercosur as a unified market itself, with the same rules, with the same countries doing the same type of, uh, of external policy. And I think both countries can benefit from this agreement and other agreements with other uh, areas of trade in the world that might be negotiated. So my vision of that is positive. Uh, I understand that many politicians are more sensitive to pressures than others. The pressures are present. Uh, that they come from industry. I am not uh, 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 avoiding any uh, accusation uh, here, uh, or it's just a, uh, I'm, I'm just telling what I feel. So I, th I think we need to work a lot, but it's certainly a very positive uh, achievement. La siguiente pregunta que viene del auditorio, eh, Celso dice que Argentina y Brasil han caminado durante los 80 y 90 casi el mismo camino en materia de economía, incluso de combate a la inflación. Eh, pero en los años 2000 los caminos se han eh, separado, dice, y eh, ¿qué le recomendaría a la Argentina para que pueda finalmente ganarle la batalla a la inflación que en Brasil ya le ganaron? Es difícil hablar sobre Argentina. Uh, uh, you know más que yo conozco. Let me tell you one difference. I, 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 I'm, I'm not giving a full explanation, just raising hypothesis here. When we decided to live with inflation, back in the PAEG, Plano de Ação Econômica do Governo, Roberto Campos and the Governo de Bulhões, that was back in 66, where the two ministers of finance, of the, the first military government in Brazil, they made this big program of reforms. That changed the tax system, that changed many, many things. Uh, but they were not very hard on fighting inflation. They decided to create a way to live with inflation, call it monetary correction. You never had it. I don't know what would have happened to Argentina if Argentina had the monetary correction, or what would happen to Brazil if Brazil didn't have the monetary correction. So I'm talking about things that didn't happen, so let me elaborate on that. By having monetary correction, the savings of Brazilians were protected against inflation risk. And Brazil's, Brazilians didn't feel like they should dollarize their assets. Argentina economy, by not having a way to protect the savings from inflationary, from inflation tax, went to a dollarization process that was much deeper than the one we had. So given the fact that we had the way to do financial intermediation, the financial system of Brazil progressed more than the financial system of Argentina. Created assets which are protected against inflation, ways of doing uh, intermediation and all that. When Argentina tried successfully for some time to reduce inflation, it went to the fixed exchange rate. This was Cavallo's thing when Pedro Po was at the central bank. Didn't control the fiscal. And of course, the fixed exchange rate blew up. And that was the end of the exercise. Brazil went to the monetary reform that eliminated indexation, and it was done. I say, uh, we stayed on an economy and we created a regime that could control inflation with enough independence of the central bank. 
I see the moment in which the two economies departed, I think was that, when that choice about living with inflation was to provoke one reaction in Brazil and another reaction in Argentina. I don't know how to disentangle the situation here now, uh, these days in Argentina. It's a very complicated issue. Uh, the economy is a lot dollarized. So it has uh, the, the living together two currencies. If you reduce the confidence in one, you shift to the other one, and then it produces a big bank. I, I really am uncertain, and I'm humbly telling you, I, I really don't know. And I know a lot of colleagues of mine, including here, that have tried to deal with this problem, and that didn't come out with uh, an answer that I could say, well, here I have something that is really uh, interesting. So uh, forgive me, but I, I, I don't have a, a y, y more specific things y, to comment. ¿Y la moneda común del Mercosur le, le serviría en eso? Mercosur is uh, uh, an agreement in trade. Of course, the country needs more stability, and Argentina needs more stability. I would be completely against something I like having a common currency. I don't think a common currency is a good idea, even to Europe, okay. because that is not an optimum currency area. And then, if you have a common currency, and suppose this common currency is the dollar, uh, <laughs> you would have to have the Federal Reserve as your central banker, which is not a comfortable situation to any one of us. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I would say uh, Argentina will have to play around a way to stabilize its economy. And uh, Mercosur, uh, <laughs> I think Mercosur can live with that if you have enough, enough flexibility on the exchange rate. Uh, If you do not have enough flexibility, then it's, uh, it's complicated. Y la última pregunta, Celso, viene también de la audiencia. Dice, si es tiempo de comprar bonos brasileños. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, I show you a yield curve there. Let me tell you a story about uh, uh, July past year. Let's say this picture I painted to you about the declining interest rates in the US, in Europe, was very clear for everyone. The only thing which was not clear is if the Federal Reserve agreed that the decline of interest rate was a one-way bet. Okay? It will decline, it will never go up. That was a moment in which the, say, Brazil nominal rate of interest, the selling was six and a half, the one year interest rate was six and a half, and the five year nominal rate of interest was eight and a half, okay? Then three things happened in that uh, July. First, we had the truck drivers in Brazil that marked politically the end of the Temer government. He lost completely the capacity to do anything We had the elections, and at that point, uh, as I said, the biggest probability was, was to elect Haddad from PT. And then Powell, after the Federal Reserve, came with a comment saying that I probably will hike the Fed funds rate. At that moment, the risks were such that there was a big upward shift on the Brazilian yield curve. So a one year that was six and a half went to eight and a half, The five years that was eight and a half went up to 13%. If at that moment I had sold my apartment, I had the courage of doing that, and buying the full amount of NTNBs coming due in 2050, the B50 uh, bond, inflation protected, and sold it yesterday, I would have two apartments now. So the decline in the yield curve was enormous. So everybody that had bought bonds at that time made a capital gain that is, is historical, historical. I don't see that thing being repeated. What I could see, if anything goes wrong in Brazil, you have a different shift that instead of flattening the curve will steepen. Okay. 
And if it does steepen, you lose money, you don't earn it. So I, would, I, I don't see Brazil yield curve steepening. Uh, let's say, uh, you can never say nothing is going to happen. Uh, Nuriel Rubini used it to say we are going to have a world recession. He repeated it for 10 years, then one year, in 2008, he was right. <laughs> My watch was broken at 3 o'clock, twice a, a day, it's right. So if everybody starts saying, well, Brazil is going to hike interest rate like crazy, one day he's going to be right. But I don't see that in the foreseeable future. So I would say that if you buy Brazil bonds, the risk of losing because of the steepening of the curve is small. But as well, the risk of having further flattening of this curve is also very, very small. So you have to content of uh, believing on a stable yield. 3% is already a good yield. And I, I think if you think like that and uh, don't want uh, to speculate on capital gains and capital losses, I think, uh, well, well, it may be a good deal. But remember that I have put there a chart showing how much volatile is the real. So if you are converting your dollars to Brazil, and then you are going to go back and convert that back into dollars, you should think about the probability of having a depreciation that washes out completely your, your, your thing. So look at the exchange rate. And, uh, that is the dominant factor in deciding if you buy or not buy Brazil bonds. Muchas gracias, Celso. Le pido un aplauso para Celso. Realmente un, un honor tenerlo acá, Celso, en este espacio de, del Banco Ciudad.